Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Good morning and welcome to our Sunday school class. We've already had a good prayer time together. Prayer is such an important part of everything that we are and do, and so we can never fail to be sure that we include an active prayer life in our as we study scripture. This is a ministry of the Rutherfordton Presbyterian Church. We have live Sunday school at 10 o'clock if you want to join us in worship service at 11. Uh, today, our pastor is actually going to be at the Union Grove Missionary Baptist Church in Columbus in a pulpit exchange. And so many of our congregation members will be there, but we'll also have a service at our church too. The Sunday school this more the Sunday school lesson this morning is called David anointed as king the passage of scripture we're looking at is first Samuel 16 and just 13 verses this ends the three unit uh, well the second unit of our three unit study of God's exceptional choice you'll remember that in the first unit we looked at uh, the the lineage where we began in our faith with the call of Abram to become Abraham. And we moved that very rapidly uh, up to the time of Judah. And then unit two was the deliverance of people out of slavery to become the nation of Israel. We have, and again, boy, we're moving through this so fast from the birth of Moses to his you know, departing words and then Gideon being called. And then uh, last week, of course, Samuel had been, the people had been whining because they didn't have a real king. And so God heard them and Samuel anointed Saul. And today we move on because Saul didn't do the job well. And so we have David anointed as king. I think you're gonna enjoy the third unit, not that you haven't enjoyed the other two, but the third unit are, we are God's artwork and the, these, the series of lessons in November come from Ephesians. So I'm looking forward to that study. The key text today is the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. First Samuel 16, seven. The context today from last week's lesson, Saul was identified by the Lord and anointed by Samuel to be Israel's first king, a, a repeat. Saul overstepped his role and he failed to obey the Lord. This is the history of the Hebrew people. This is what they seem to always do. But here God gave them what they wanted and then Saul got absorbed with the power that it was and he failed to realize who really was king. And so he began to make selfish decisions. He used people. He was not consistently faithful and obedient to the Lord. He proved that he couldn't really be king. This was one of the ways you could look at it. God telling his people that, that they didn't need the earthly king because the earthly king couldn't do it. But at the same time, Saul had been chosen. So what do you do? The Lord regretted his choice of Saul and he, and he decided to find another king. Saul reigned from 1050 to 1010 BC. So that's a period of 40 years. 40 years is a long time to do bad stuff, right? I mean, we know from just our studies of governments that 40 years is, a little over a generation. So the people who were under his rule, by the time you get 30 years in, the old people have died. They don't remember what it was like before. And you've got a real power grab here with Saul. So he's got 40 years of looking away from God, maybe not at the beginning, but as it goes. The events of today's lesson happened during Saul's reign. So he knows ahead of time that his line is not going to be the line that starts the dynasty in Israel. 
So think about that for just a second. Saul knows. Well, how does he know? Well, because Samuel's still around. And so there is a, a, time, a, a period of time when Saul's still listening to Samuel just disregards him. So even though the prophet is there, he's doing what the prophet is supposed to do, which is help the king uh, stay in line, the king rejects that help. From 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 3, we read, The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king of Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So Samuel's talking to the Lord all the time. We talk about prayer. These prophets were, they didn't get help from anywhere but from God, which is pretty much help, right? But Samuel is just at his wit's end and he has, he has mourned. He's done the sackcloth and ashes stuff. He has just been so displeased, but Saul is not hearing him. And so the Lord has dealt with Samuel all this time. And so finally he says to Samuel, just get your stuff ready and go to Bethlehem. Go to Jesse, because I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. So what's Samuel's response to the Lord? When the Lord says go, he says, how can I go? Because Saul's going to kill me. And God says, just take a heifer and tell him you're coming to sacrifice. And so guess what happens? Samuel goes. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. Let's pause there for a second. Why would that be? Well, Samuel is a spokesman still for Saul. And so the people who he, where he is going to in Bethlehem could be frightened just at the mere appearance of Samuel because they don't know why he's coming. And because Saul is the kind of ruler he is, people are just uncertain. So when he arrives at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled and they asked, do you come in peace? And Samuel rep replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Good thing the Lord told him about that heifer, right? Consecrate yourselves and come to, sac to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. You remember in the Hebrew times, you didn't just come worship and you didn't just come sacrifice. There had to be a cleansing of self before you came to the table. And I think that's one of those things we so easily forget. You know, we're so busy in our minds with things that when we come to the, to the table of worship and of, of giving ourselves to the worship of God, if we haven't prepared ourselves to do that, it's kind of tough. You know, the way services, our services start is we start with a, a piano interlude or, or some kind of music usually. And it's the whole idea of that is to calmly transition into this idea of worship. That's historical and it's also just one of those things that makes good sense. We have to clear our minds to be able to worship. And in this particular situation, they had to, to purify themselves before they sacrifice. Verse 6. When they arrived, Samuel saw, and they're at, they're at Jesse's place now. When they arrived, Samuel saw, saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. 
But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance of his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, in, in biblical times, it was use, usually what happened with the human kings. They were, one of the things they were was very strong warrior-like people, big people. Why was that true? Because they were going to have to fight to keep things. Uh, they were going to have to be willing to defend their land and take new lands, etc. Now, those are the human kings. So in their minds, this was the same kind of idea that had to happen. Eliab was a strong man. He was a tall man. And so the Lord has to make it clear to Samuel which of the sons it is that he is choosing. And it's not Eliab. And again, he says to Samuel, it's not what he looks like, it's what, his, what is on his heart. Verse 8, then Jesse called Amenadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammoth pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Now, can you imagine that Jesse is thinking, these are my, my good sons. These are the older sons. These are the ones that are bound to be ready for this great anointing. I don't understand what's going on. And then he says, Jesse says, in verse 10, Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. But put yourself in that place. You know, if you, you got your best kids out there and you're looking and looking and looking and none of those work. So then Samuel asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Surely this process has taken some time as they're looking over the sons and God's talking to Samuel the whole time. And then this is not an unusual thing that the youngest child is out tending the flock. That's one of the ways they learn discipline. And so he's saying, my youngest son is still out there. I don't think that's the one you're looking for, but Samuel says, we're not gonna sit down until he comes. So we sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. This is interesting too, because we've had the verse of the Lord looking on the heart, but he didn't disregard that he was a healthy young man at this point. And the Lord, when he, he sees David, he says to Samuel, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers and from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. This is really an important event because, number one, Saul was still king. He's going to be king. Just because David is anointed doesn't make him king then. Still probably got another historian, say, another 10 years, decade. And those are going to be uh, tumultuous years, too. But it's going to be as he develops. He's not a young, young man, but he is a young man. And he still has development to do. And he still has growing to do. And don't you know, the Lord dealt with him across that time period. Because he's being anointed for the future. So what he's got to do is this heart development thing. And again, we have talked for several weeks about how God uses who he uses. He calls who he calls. And sometimes he's going to call somebody who doesn't have it all together. Um, he's going to call who he calls because he sees a heart that is in development. He sees something in David that other people don't necessarily see. 
but God doesn't then abandon him and say, wait for 10 years or wait till he winds up using David to help make this transition with Saul. You know, we're going to get uh, in our, in our scriptures uh, moving forward. If we went through chronology about David and Jonathan, Saul's son, that friendship that develops, there's so much rich history biblical history about David's development. Once he is anointed, he knows he's got special work to get, do. And I'm sure with Samuel's guidance, he becomes more in touch with who God is. It makes a difference because it's going to be David's line that leads us to Jesus. What does David have to do? What does Samuel have to do? Well, it's really pretty clear that this whole passage in this lesson today is about walking by faith. The Lord chose David not on the things that we would necessarily choose. He looked on David's heart, which was young, impressionable, and evidently he had been raised in Hebrew tradition and was out there being faithful to the flock. Too often our choices are out of fear or something that, that may happen. And so we don't do something simply because we're fearful of it. Samuel was scared to death he was going to get killed, right? He says, if I do this, Saul's going to be so mad. And, and God's guidance was clear. Just take a heifer. Just go do what I told you to do. We too are anointed with the Holy Spirit. You know, once, once Christ came, things change we don't necessarily have to have prophets that act on behalf of the lord because the holy spirit is amongst us and is with us that's important because the holy spirit leads not out of fear or what we can see but with confidence in what we cannot see that's where hope comes from i am moved by this fall season more than i have ever been about God's presence still in the world and that he's got control of this. You know, the absolute gorgeous colors, the, the, even when we have rainy and overcast days, it somehow even brightens the colors. God still has the plan. He has given us the Holy Spirit to be a daily presence in our lives. That's such a huge advantage we had over the people of the Old Testament. God often was with his people, but they didn't know him as the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so this is extremely important that we continue to remember that hope comes because we have the Holy Spirit with us. Bad things can happen. And if we leave it to our own devices, we often react or act out of fear instead of the hope that God gives us. And he calls us, each of us, to move forward, walking by faith. Samuel feared for his own safety and did not know the whole story to come. But the Lord gave him information as he needed it, just in time. Have you had those experiences in your life? I certainly have. And we could, we could share an, another time about those things. When we were frightened or we didn't know ahead of time, but we took the one step forward simply because we know God's in control. God gave Samuel the information that he needed just in time. When we focus on being more like Jesus, we can work confidently as he calls others to love him as we work together. Our whole existence today in this crazy, out of hand world has got to be building a stronger faith or a, a, a solid faith in the hope of the resurrection in Jesus Christ. That comes through faith. Faith is having the clear understanding that we can't see it all, but God can. We must ask God for the heart to see what he sees, to see past all the terror 
fear of sin to his redeeming work and his desire for the hearts of all people. As David prayed in Psalm 51, may our prayer be, Lord, create in me a pure heart. Let us pray. Lord God, teach us to value the heart over the outward appearance of a person. Purify our own hearts so that when others see us, they will see that you have chosen us and are forming us in the image of Jesus. It is in his holy name we pray. Amen.